I'll go ahead and call to order this meeting of the Planning Commission, uh, this September 14th meeting. Uh, first thing we need to do is approve the agenda. Everyone can take a look at that and provide a motion. I move to approve the agenda. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Do the rest. <laughs> uh, I'll give it to Stephanie by, by a hair. She got in there. Okay, uh, so uh, motion by Barb, second by Stephanie. All in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, agenda is approved. First item we have is comments from the chair. Uh, the only thing I have to say is that uh, the housing group, which consists of Barb and Ariane and myself, uh, are, are scheduled to meet on Thursday. Uh, Barb has some, has some things that we're going to, to uh, consider. I have some things. I'm gonna try to get those to you, Barb, um, in advance. A what I'm going to do is, uh, well, I don't know. I, I don't need to go over that here. But uh, so we're we're going to meet. We we don't have a process figured out yet because we're waiting from the uh, uh, what's our what's our working group Con uh, continuity and structure. Uh, group, we're still waiting to hear from them about, you know, having some sort of template to follow. So I guess Barb will probably have to meet again once we know more about that. So what you're thinking? Yeah, I think, you know, just for this meeting, we can just put together a rough agenda. And uh, so we can just start mo kicking the can down the road here. So okay. I'll put something together as a rough agenda. Um, if, uh, if you want to get me that stuff that you have beforehand, Kirby. Okay. I'll set aside uh, sometime tomorrow then do that. Great. So, you know, we've, so we've got that, we've got that coming. Uh, and, uh, and that's, that's great. I mean, that's, it's going to be, you know, the, the first working group we have going, but it'll be nice once we get with, get those rolling out. Uh, that's all I've got though. That's the only update. Um, so, uh, unless anyone has anything else they'd like to just, I have a question. Um, so reading through the minutes, it reminded me about the city council meeting to discuss the zoning change. Can we get an update on that? Good call. I want to know too. I actually didn't follow up. So uh, everything did pass. It was a little bit surprising that everything kind of went through um, all in one shot. So they took testimony um, and were swayed uh, certainly by the presentation that Brooke gave. Um, and so they, they approved both sets of changes. They received no comments at all on the design review. So that kind of just floated right through. And then the Pioneer Street went through um, after a bit of discussion um, on, the, on some of the details. There was, there were some questions they wanted to understand why there was so much conversation at the Planning Commission level on it. Um, they felt it was a pretty straightforward request. So, and I said that you guys had thought much, much deeper about the consequences of it. And it wasn't fully, people voted in favor of it, but I think some of them were still hoping that things would be different in going into the future. They did want things better and different in this area, but at the same time, they recognized the amount of time that the Barretts had owned the land and improved the land and um, that they felt there wasn't gonna be a lot of change in this area in its current ownership. So they felt it was better to let them infill within their, their idea and they went along with just what you guys had proposed for that narrow change of boundary. Okay. So that, and that will go into effect on the 17th. So uh, I've made the changes to uh, the text and it would been proofread by Meredith. So we have that ready to go. I just have one small typo that I've got to fix and um, we'll get those put online. 
and the map was uh, just received about 15 minutes ago. So that's all ready to go. Okay, then. So I guess we did a pretty good job. They didn't change a thing. Uh, Are we thanks, gonna, Mike. Have a quick, I got a quick thing that's just a separate an item of interest. Um, so I just was made aware of a new resource called Black Voices on the City. It's, it's a resource guide that came out of um, mostly McGill University, I believe. It's brand new. It just got launched today. And it's essentially an online database that compiles um, written work, interviews, and papers, and other things from Black urban planners. And it's um, just a good resource. It looks like it's going to be a really good resource to amplify Black voices. And I can share that with everyone via email if you're interested, or I probably will just share it if that's okay. Yeah. You can look at it. Yeah. That, that would it's, be great. it's brand new. It's, yeah, it's got a good, it looks like it's got a pretty good um, detail, like different, you can kind of search by topic or by type of material. There's thesis, like a PhD thesis, um, reports, videos, online journal articles, books, um, and they're actively growing it. So. Um, and it's not just students at McGill, students and alum of McGill, but uh, that's kind of where it started and it's growing from there. So. Great. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, it's definitely something for us to try to incorporate into the city plan. Yeah. Does anybody else have anything? Okay. I should probably, uh, yeah expand comments from the chair to comments from everybody from now on. Okay. Uh, okay. With that, I'm going to uh, move on to the general business. Uh, do we have any members of the public who have joined us? I see Mr. Shears here. We have him on the agenda. Um, so anyone else? Nope. Okay. Well, uh, the next item on the agenda then is to consider the minutes from August 24th. Everyone will take a look at what Mike sent. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes when everyone's done. I'll second. Okay. Uh, speak up if you're not ready. Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. Hi. Any opposed? Okay. Minutes from twenty fourth are approved. Which moves us further along our agenda to uh, a discussion with uh, Mr. Richard Shear uh, and his request to exempt banners from local zoning review. So we are mostly not caught up on this. Um, so if Mr. Shear, if you're there, if you would like to explain, actually before, before we have Mr. Shear explain, uh, Mike, will you kind of set the stage for us about the request? The, um, you know, the, the procedural, especially about, about where this fits in with our role. Okay. So I'm still waiting to see if he, uh, so he made it in, and then I saw a second request for him to come in, so I'm not sure if he's okay. trying to get in again. Um, but the short... Ah, there we go. Maybe he's... Maybe we have Richard now. So uh, so the where the origins of this came in was a request... Uh, and I'll summarize it as quickly as I can remember it. Uh, Mr. Shear wanted to have a banner put up to advertise uh, a, a fundraiser of sorts in, uh, in South Burlington. And the banner would uh, go across um, one of the public streets. We don't have a street banner. I don't know if it was across uh, Maine or across state, but we didn't, we didn't have a pre-approved banner location. So we identified a couple options um, that city council could do. City council could request a banner location, much the same way that when I was in the city of Barrie, Barrie had a public banner location. 
um, that had been approved, uh, gotten a permit. It used to be right behind the memorial there um, where the naked guy is. Um, but considering it was such a symbolic um, statue, uh, we felt it would be more appropriate to have the banner somewhere else. So we moved the banners to the location of the library. Um, and then once it, the location was approved, city council would then have a process for approving new banners. So anyone who wanted to put up a banner would have to meet certain requirements and they could put up the banner. Um, and we kind of felt that's probably the best approach for the city to take if they want to have a banner location is just to get one pre-approved, get the location. From that point forward, the city council would have a set of policies that would state what banners could go up for how long. Um, in much the same way they have a policy right now for, for painting the street and a couple other related policies. So I think that was would be my suggested way of going. Um, but there are other ways of, of individually doing them or privately doing them. Um, but Mr. Shear wanted to come in, Richard wanted to come in and address the planning commission on this. Um, currently in the zoning, you know, it, it is what it is in the zoning. So um, that's where we are, we're at. We can't simply approve this without going to the DRC. Um, we can approve that, that banner individually, but it would have to go through the design review committee and it would take some time so uh, I guess I'll turn it back over to you, Kirby. And if you want to turn it over to Richard, you're welcome to. Uh, yeah, that's great. Thank you, Mike, for the, for the background. So yeah, Mr. Shear, if you're there, uh, go ahead and, and explain to us what you're proposing and um, yeah, you know, what your expectations are for us. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Hopefully. Okay, good, good. Uh, I thought Mike did an, a real good job of summarizing what I was talking about. Uh, I wanted to commend his staff for their work on kind of informing me on what the, the current situation would be on an event spanner. Let me, let me back it off a little bit. Um, this has been under discussion for years, and Basically, we are one of the only towns in Vermont, major towns, that don't have an events banner. If you were to go through Essex, you'd see events banners. If you go through Winooski, you'd see them. If you go on Burlington on 7, if you go on Burlington on 2, you see them. If you go through uh, Bennington, you see them. If you go through Brattleboro, you see them. And again, from what I gathered, it's our rules on events banners having to go through development review is really restrictive. And what I didn't want was to walk away today with a decision on events banners, but I just wanted to raise the issue so that in the future it would be easier to discuss events, turning an events banner, not over to me, but if an organization like Montpelier Alive wanted to do an events banner or if consortium of downtown businesses wanted to do it, it would be possible without having to go through design review because that's really, really restrictive. And that no other town in, in Vermont really forces banner that I know of, forces banners through design review. So I think the fundamental question I wanted to ask planning is you guys are the ones who look for our downtown, look out for our downtown and the presentation of our downtown. Is there an objection to an event spanner that would be similarly positioned as the Christmas lights above state and Maine are currently positioned? Is there some objection to that? On a philosophic basis. Yeah, I don't I don't think we have much opinion. I mean, it's not something that we've expressly discussed before. Um, but, you know, I don't think there's any reason for us to be, you know, biased against it or anything like that. Um, I have one question for you. Um, if, if we don't have design review screen, you know, the process, who would decide the process? Would, are you, do you think like Mike's office would decide if something's appropriate to put on the banner uh, or, or who? It very much depends on, on who. Uh, is it, the banner would be put up, it's usually put up by a person who has the crane, which is the fire department. But I would imagine that if it were Montpelier Alive, that Montpelier Alive would screen the contents within a broad parameter that it wouldn't be used for commercial purposes or whatever. Um, but 
I would imagine if, if the Montpelier Business Association wanted to do it, they would screen. If Microsoft has wanted to do it, they would screen, but we'd have content parameters and we'd have design parameters so that it wouldn't strictly be the amateur hour. I mean, that's within a town's prerogative to make sure that the signing looks professional. Um, or at least in my view, that you don't want bed sheets, you know, cut to a specification and painted. But I think that that's just a detail issue further down. I just don't like the idea of having to go through design review because uh, we've done that with my wife's store and it's, it's not a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, and, and they hold guidelines for a reason. You know, the, the signs in front of the stores are gonna be there for a while. This is gonna be there for a week or two weeks. And it's a different criteria than design review was really set up to do, I think. But I, it's, as I said before, Kirby, I wanted to open up a, a long-term discussion. This isn't going to happen next week. It's not going to happen before winter. I just wanted to see if very possibly we could do this in a longer-term framework so that it's possible for next summer. So I'm not asking design. I'm not asking development to do anything tonight other than to say, yeah, we'll take a look at it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, does anyone else have questions? For Mr. Shear, looks like Barb has a question, and then Marcella. Um, yes, Mr. Shear. So, what uh, what particularly is restrictive about going through DRB, other than, of course, the timing? I imagine the timing is a little bit extended. Um, what did, what do you imagine running into uh, if you were to try and have a banner approved? Um. When we went through, as you know, as you, I'm certain that you know, my wife has a downtown store. Mm -hmm. um, my wife, if you don't know, my wife has the quirky pets. And when we went to put up our sign, we got all kinds of questions about color. Uh, we've had other merchants who've had questions about design itself, color combinations, really things that, that in terms of a temporary sign, we got the feeling, and in fact, we know for a certainty, we've put up temporary signs in front of the Corky Pet, and Bill has given us permission to do it without going through des development review, or design review, I'm sorry, de design review. Uh, we have our young entrepreneurs who used to come on Saturdays in front of the store, and we have the, the young entrepreneurs banner. We didn't have to take that through uh, I review because it was it's up on a Saturday for a couple of hours. It's a temporary sign. So I would say that develop design review was set up for signs that are going to be uh, non-durable, but uh, an event sign is something that's durable. We could set up broad de design parameters, pass those through design review. I'm, in fact, it would probably be appropriate for that to be passed through design review. But once you get to the, the micro level of this, that I feel like is not a design review question. It's not tight. So that, that's my feeling on design. Plus, of course, it would also be a $60 fee for anyone who wanted to put a sign up, which I feel is restrictive because you're dealing for the most part with nonprofit organizations. So I see this as non-commercial. I see this as, as a, just what it is, it's events. You know, it would, it would advertise the market that's um, at the high, might be at the high school this year before Thanksgiving. It would advertise Montpelier Madness. It would advertise uh, different community events and give us more of a sense of cohesion and, and community. And I am concerned about reestablishing community downtown. Uh, I mean, through no fault of our own, um, our sense of, of shared community has been disrupted severely. So this is not a, a short-term thing. This is a long-term discussion, a back and forth. And Kirby, I would appreciate it if, if I could work with Mike on framing something to come back to the commission again in a more detailed manner, fleshed out more. Okay. Um, yeah, let's let's discuss that in a minute. Uh, let, uh, let the planning commission get through their questions and we can discuss like next steps. Does that sound okay? 
That, that's fine. Whatever you guys want. Uh, again, I'm so, not looking for any short-term commitment. Right, yeah. So I think Marcella had a question. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted, maybe this is for Mike. I just wanted to confirm right now, if you want to put up a temporary sign, you have to go through the design review or the development review board? Design review committee or development review board? It's design review committee. Um, unless, unless there's some other reason that it goes to the DRB, it would just go back to the administrative officer to the issue. So most of what will be reviewed um, is going to be probably how the, how the, what materials, how the, how it's mounted to the buildings. A lot of what design review looks at are, are items like um, how it's mounted into the mortar on the bricks and um, is it on historic buildings or not historic buildings or those types of features and questions. Um, but um, yeah, so that's, that's what they would be looking at. And then it would come back to the, to the zoning administrator. The, the two questions or the two issues that come up, one is um, a banner that goes over um, either state or Maine or both is over city property because the city owns the street. So the city has to be the applicant or, or the property owner. So this could be something, as we said, that is approved. Um, there doesn't have to be a zoning change. This can go through simply as an application to the DRC once and get, get an approval for a banner that meets certain specifications and then issued changes issued going forward to whoever the approved applicant is, which could be you know city council or some other agent. And so I think that'll be one of the questions that comes up. I don't think we technically need to have a zoning change to do what Richard wants to do. I think it could just be an application that goes through, as I said, in the same way that the, the application went through in Barry City for the banner in Barry City. It went through the design review, but it only had to go through once. Once it went through, city council had a thing, had a set of policies that said, if you want to use the public community banner, then you need to make a request or you can reserve the date in advance. And they had a set of rules that would lay out, you know, who you would make the request to. I think it was to the city manager in Barry city. You would then go on the consent agenda um, and it would get all the sign offs of all the departments that said, yes, we re reviewed, they've got, they meet the material requirement. They meet the, content requirement that basically says, you know, it's not for commercial purposes. And then it's going on the banner, it's going to meet this size. Um, and then the city council would approve it by consent. Um, that's, that's probably the best route to take on a, on a project like this. Um, because once it goes through once, we've got all the criteria set out. So I think that sounds like a great avenue to try to to try to do this if if it's going to happen. Who would in in your in in your mind, Mike, who might be the best applicant? Would it be Montpelier Alive? Would it be City Council? Someone else? And then my follow up to that is, or my part B to that is, uh, would that party be interested in doing this, or is is or is that the next step for us to investigate? I think that would be the next step that would have to be figured out is who is going to who is going to manage this going forward? Is the city interested in stepping up and being the manager or is it something that um, in, in some ways, city council will have to be involved in some ways because if it was say Montpelier alive, um, they're still operating over the city's right of way. So the city would have to in some way have a memorandum of understanding with Montpelier alive that says, we agree to give you the power to make these decisions on our behalf, provided you meet these policy requirements or, or whatever. Um, I'm sure there just have to be some kind of MOU between the two organizations that would allow them to, to operate in that capacity. Otherwise it'll have to go, it, it, could, it could be the city decides to just do it themselves and it's operated through the manager's office. It probably would not come back through my office. It would probably be managed through the manager's office would be my guess. We probably run it through legal at some point. When we, when we get there, we would probably have this, get a legal opinion on whether or not this is more appropriate. And I think it would be 
to run through the manager's office, in which case it's still a set of policies that city council would approve. Um, that would just go through and say, here's here, here are your directives, Mr. City Manager. Um, in the same way we do street closures and a number of things, we, as a staff person, various things come through and uh, we just have to do sign offs on them. So um, I'm trying to think of one, a parklet. Uh, parklets are in the city right of way. They are exempt from the zoning. Um, in order to put one up, a request will come through and go through all the department heads. And you'll have to go through and get a sign off from the fire department that it's not gonna impede fire trucks. You'll have to get an approval from public works that says it's not gonna impede um, you know, but for a banner that's so high up in the air, it's probably going to only need to sign off from city council or from uh, the manager's office because they're just going to confirm the material, the content, and a couple other re requirements. And then whether there's a fee or not, um, you know, will we charge a fee for that? That's not my department. That's city council's decision as to whether or not they want to charge a fee for putting up and taking down the banner. Okay. Uh, looks like a Barb has something. Yeah, Mike, I just have a quick question. Um, is isn't State Street a uh, state highway considered? Do we have any considerations with that? It is. Uh, it is a state highway. Uh, we could not do anything within the Capitol complex, but I don't think any of the discussions we're having right now are in the Capitol complex. Um, all state highways in the city of Montpelier are owned by the city of Montpelier. So we have class one, we have class one town highways for our state highways. So these, we don't have to ask AOT permission to do this because they're already ours. So my, for what I'm understanding is that it, it would be best for the city manager's office to be the, to be involved if we, if we think that the process that Mike just laid out was the best, have they been involved so far with this? Are they aware? Uh, they, they're aware of the, this conversation. Um, I, I don't know if, you know, the question will be, how do we, how do we get this into effect? I don't know who, who is going to carry the ball. It may be something that, Montpelier Alive makes the request or, or the planning department makes the request or Richard himself makes the request to um, to get this process going to ask the city manager to apply for that permit. I'm not sure the the trigger, I guess, in that who's 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 leading the charge to get this permit approved so we can get that banner location set. And I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. So, so Mr. Chair, are you, are you following what Mike is saying is that we, you know, the, as far as the DRC is involved under, under the, the current, you know, rules and, and law, uh, you know, we could get the ball rolling on this without changing city ordinance or anything. And it would only have to go through design review one time. And then we would, you know, it, the, the hard part of it would be setting up this process for uh, whoever's in charge, figuring out who should be in charge of the banner and 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 the contents and and you know going through the process each time it goes up and down and like like setting that up and figuring that out sounds like the hard part can, relative to the to the grand scheme of things as opposed to the DRC part of it. Um, what are your th what are your thoughts on that, uh, Mr. Shear? I thought I thought what Mike said was extremely reasonable. I think Bill and his and his staff are the people who should be the point people. Uh, I would be willing, or I am willing, to sit and work on the logistics along with Bill and, and his crew. Uh, what I came to your board is just aesthetically, do you believe that this would be detrimental to our downtown and to your vision of what our downtown, that's why I'm here today is, is just to cut you guys in at the very, very beginning. Okay. Yeah, we appreciate that. Uh, does anyone in the planning commission want to respond on that note about thoughts on the existence of a banner? 
No. I think, I think I, I like the idea of making this as simple as possible. And if an entity like Montpelier Alive could just take this and they have certain parameters and they can run with it, then great. Like let's. It, the beauty about these things are that it's temporary. So, um, you know, this idea that there should be a long back and forth and a process set up. Like, no, let's let's do it, and then if there are issues, then we can address those because these are temporary banners. So, like, let's make it as easy and pos as possible. Let's, let's like move forward with it and and adjust as as we go. Well, thanks, John. Does anybody else have anything? Okay. Um, I, I don't think we need to take a vote or anything. Uh, we just, we appreciate you, you bring this to us, Mr. Shear. Uh, you know, our understanding is it looks like uh, the city manager's office and maybe my pillar alive will be involved going forward. Uh, but no, I don't, it sounds like there's no hang up from the planning commission. You don't have to worry about us. Perfect. Thank you so very much. I'm going to help my wife paint the house. Okay. Have a good night. You as well. Take care, guys. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think that went okay. Uh, and I don't, yeah, I don't think anything fell in my lap as far as work. So that's good. Like I sometimes worry about dumping too much on him because <laughs> he does so much for us. Uh, okay. Well, with that, we can move on to the city plan and the transportation implementation strategies. I think Mike sent uh, some documents around for us. Did I actually remember to send out the, no. Um, so, oh, which I guess I should have sent out um, a follow-up. The transportation committee did not have a quorum, so they didn't make any decision on Friday. So we are still with the draft that we had from two weeks ago. Okay. And if somebody uh, wants, I can resend that out. So, Mike, are they are they thinking they will be mo making modifications or clarifications, uh, and the piece that we're actually working on now is not going to be not going to resemble their final proposal? I always try to avoid guessing where committees are going to go and what they're going to do. Um, they're supposedly only going to be working on making um priorities so that was what they were supposed to be meeting on was to go through and prioritize what what they wanted to put as high medium and low for the next um work over the eight years and so i'm hoping that will go through relatively quick um but you said that their strategies are not where they need to be Correct. Um, they, well, they finished their strategies. I still think within, um, they're still going to need to have some work on their strategies. Ultimately, I think unlike a lot of the committees, I think a lot of the committees really worked this all the way to the end. Uh, the transportation committee really had a hard time getting there. So they pretty much left a lot of things open. And I think there are some areas, if you get into it and you read, read it, you'll recognize there are just some topics that aren't discussed that probably should be discussed. Um, you know, there's not a lot about the, um, the, the pavement side of things or the, um, the road, the road, the vehicle, there's a lot on bikes, there's a lot on ped. Um, but there are some other areas where there are just some gaps that, I think need to be touched on, but we can get into those when we get them and start to see, you know, I think like safety comes up in two different places. I don't know if we should just consolidate that into one. Um, the hope is that all of their thoughts are there. So you can kind of kind of absorb where they want to go 
understand what they're trying to do and then make some adjustments. So I think unlike a lot of the housing and historic where we kind of reviewed it and tweaked it here and there, there may be a little bit more work that we have to do with transportation. Yeah, it does seem like there are whole areas that they didn't touch on and maybe it, they didn't feel that they were un, in their purview, but, um, you know, no consideration of, of commuter or rail. <clears throat> and they allude to transit oriented design, but they don't really call that out. So anyway, I think that there's some um, holes in it right now. Well, for, for tonight, I mean, we, we, we've already discussed the aspirations and the goals last week. I think we, we had some good comments. Um, do we feel like we need to spend time tonight discussing that further or, or do we just, do we just wait and call it? You have some thoughts, Barb. Yeah, I did have one question um, specifically about the inter interconnection between this and the and <clears throat> excuse me, the energy plan, because um, the energy plan touches on transportation as well. Correct, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so I'm not exactly clear about where that line is going to be end up being. Um, you know, are we? because they reference fossil fuels as well, vehicles as well. Um, they sort of make um, some allusions to reducing traffic downtown, but not specific. So where, where should the line fall? Uh, within their third aspiration, they, they have one about having a transportation system that's sustainable and um, environmentally responsible, something to that effect. And so they reference in that third aspiration, um, having strategies of supporting the energy plan. So they're not going to get into the electric car discussion. They're pretty much going through and, and following the guidance of the energy plan when it comes to that, recognizing within that same third aspiration, one of the goals is to, is to, look at obviously the the land use and the density they they want to support the housing plans and these other plans that are putting more density in the downtown um, because that's going to make things more walkable and bikeable and um, the more we can put things in a higher density the the less reliant someone um, needs to be for a car but at the same time it's all it's all a matter of balancing when you're doing you know car share, and a number of things, there's still cars. And you know, the question still comes up about, you know, they had a lot of debates about the parking garage and whether or not they wanted, you know, the parking in the downtown or any parking in the downtown. And, you know, we, we said that even in the net, even in the net, net zero competitions, they still talked about parking garages in the downtown. They just looking at them with the ability of consolidating surface parking lots into structured parking. So that way we can open up surface parking lots for redevelopment. Um, and that's a strategy. Some people didn't like that strategy. They wanted to have less cars or no cars. And we said, well, you know, you want to get cars off the street. You want to get on street parking off. That means you'll probably need off street parking. It's a balancing act unless you're going to go to a point of having a policy which there are two members of the city council on the transportation committee and both city councilors said, you know, that's, that's not something that has any legs at the council to just go through and say, we're going to have no cars in the downtown. We're going to have parking structures. We're going to have cars. Our preference is for a parking structure where we can park cars that is going to be EV, you know, if, if cars become less and less common, then we're gonna remove more and more other parking lots until the only thing that's left is that parking structure that has the electric charging stations in it. And that's kind of their philosophy is that it's a well-located near, near the transit hub, near the downtown, near the 
capital complex and therefore that's probably the best location and people are going to disagree with that but that's pretty much where the council is sitting um, but the transportation committee has some of their opinions on um, and, and I think that was the hard part for them was just trying to get over some of the, the differences of opinion unlike a lot of committees where there's a lot of agreement on exactly what we want transportation doesn't have that single opinion of what their vision of the future is. Yeah, that's that's my concern just because uh, under aspiration C, the second goal that talks about uh, environmentally responsible in, in minimizing negative impacts is pretty vague. It uh, doesn't really um, give much specificity in terms of, of what they would actually propose as strategies under that. Um, but it's certainly, I mean, it's something that we can um, take a look at in the subcommittee, but I just wondered what other members of the Planning Commission felt about this document in general. Yeah, it seems like um, it's okay not to have all of the answers, but identifying the, the questions would be helpful. And, and you can set out in a plan identify what those questions are and say like the plan is to to work on those and answer them um but yeah a lot of it did seem a little vague it also it was sort of absent of any place it was just kind of out there this you know these goals and aspirations could apply to literally any place on the planet and most people would be like, yeah, that sounds good. You know, more people on bikes and walking around. Like, of course we want those things, but it doesn't really do much to get us there. And one of the, the, the challenges I think, or things that might be helpful for us and them to think about or work on is identifying specifically, like what are the streets that we have that are going to be, um, places that are, you know, our highest value for, for pedestrians and cyclists and what changes need to happen for those to be comfortable to be, to walk and bike. And what are those roads that are uh, not going to be that, that are going to move cars, right? You can't, you, you can have roads that are places that are for people and walking, and you can have others that are made to move uh, vehicles as efficiently as possible. And you, you can't, we sometimes trick ourselves into thinking we can have both and you can't like you have to pick one. And that's one of the actual requirements that we have in statute is to identify the function of some of these roadways. Um, so um, some of it's, some of it's easy and obvious, but finding those edges and finding where those questions are, I feel like is, is a discussion we'll have to have and maybe something the transportation committee wants to think about. Yeah, we have, we have some of that laid out in our complete streets plan, which is, you know, has the street typologies and it has a map and it, and it lays out what we want for streets. And we have Montpelier motion, which is a little bit of a gap analysis. We have the downtown master plan. Um, so we kind of have the maps and trying to get those now into implementation um is is the challenge for them um but you're right the the challenge is the the hardest streets were the ones that you know when we did the complete streets plan we we laid out what we would expect based on the functioning of the street and um there were certain streets where the street didn't match its typology and you know the two that came out one was Barry Street and the other one is uh, Elm Street as you head north on route, route 12 just after you turn off Spring Street that stretch um, out through past the meadow and both of them have the same conflict um, both of those based on typology should have uh, separated bike lanes or uh, no on-street parking and they both have on-street parking. So it pretty much is, as, if, as you, you know, kind of look at it, you could automatically go through and say, these are gonna be the conflict points. And when you talk to people, those are the conflict points. Um, and the issue is coming up with how do we solve those, 
really tough places. The rest of it is pretty well accepted. You can look at the street typology and say, this road isn't wide enough. And we need, next time we pave it, we need to widen it to add a, uh, an uphill bike lane um, or something to that effect. So most of the other ones pretty much lay out without much conflict, but there are a couple of places, Elm Street, Berry Street, it's just has way too much um, overlap and conflict between where we park cars, um, you know, low income neighborhood, um, not a lot of off street parking options for people. Um, we can put in bike lanes, but at the, at the cost of the on street parking and that's, you know, the parking that low income folks rely on or the other option is, you know, to, to find another location for the bike paths. And I think that's just the conflict that we've got to work through on, a, on those few locations. So yeah, we've got to get, get the planning done, but at least a number of the, the, those big planning documents have been done. And the other suggestion I made to the transportation committee is to get more involved and to request to be on the, the CIP, the Capital Improvement uh, Committee, because that's where the rubber hits the road, you know, literally in this case for the transportation plan, um, if, if you're interested in, if your entire transportation plan is really based on making sure that your projects are being prioritized and getting into the queue, then you really need to be involved in the CIP as it gets developed and as it gets developed year over year over year. So you can start pushing for projects in, in year two, year five, year seven. Um, and they haven't been involved. And I think that's why predominantly the CIP focuses on paving and less so on making these complete street improvements. I think that's, that's something that it was a suggestion to them that they're going to try to get more involved in the CIP process. Uh, do we have any more thoughts about the, uh, transportation plan as it stands or do we do we want to I mean it, it seems natural that we would want to wait for it to, to you know to be in a more complete form um what do you what do you think Stephanie? I'm just wondering are they so the, those other plans that you mentioned Mike are they going to be incorporating things from that within their strategies I mean I think right now they are pretty general and they're not including those sort of situations, but those conflict points are to me, what's really interesting. And that's what's, what's worth talking about and figuring out how we can, how we can move those things forward. Um, but I think from the transportation section, I think those things need to come up within the plan. So I'm wondering how, how the, is, is it this group that's going to be coordinating some of those things a little bit more into their next iteration? Yeah. Um, so I think the, the, the big picture is the focus on, because they have these, you know, they have a plan that says, you know, you can look at the plan and go through and say on this street, it should have this street type, which would have these, um, you know, and a type four street may have a sidewalk on one side and bike lanes, but no on street parking or something like that. That would be a street type. And then every street was given a street type. So that way it was both complete and appropriate for its setting. And it balances everything from speed limits to lane width to accommodating bicycles. So in, in your smallest, lowest density residential street, it might be um, a shared road situation with eight foot bike lanes because you know there's, there's just not enough traffic to warrant putting in bike lanes. Um, so bikes are expected to share the lane and maybe there isn't even a sidewalk. Um, maybe people are walking on the, on the shoulder. If it's a short dead end street with, you know, uh, you know, 10 vehicles a day. Um, and then it kind of builds up to the, uh, builds up from there. So we have a plan that kind of lays all these things out. What, um, you know, we, and again, we didn't want perfect to get to be, to be the enemy of the good. What we talked about, what I think is, is missing for, the transportation committee is, um, I think the energy committee is a step ahead. They are actually trying to build in their benchmarks of, all right, we've got this goal of where we want to get to by 2030 and where we want to get to by 2050. And here are the benchmarks that we want to hit. 
um, or here's our measure. I think what the transportation committee is missing and they need to do a study on is to really start to go and look out, um, do a study to understand, okay, what is our goal? Um, do we wanna have all of our streets to be complete streets before 2040, let's say? And what would that cost? What would that take? And what would we have to do? What benchmarks would we have to hit if we wanted to make that make that a reality? If we want to have all of our streets that if they're supposed to have a bike lane, they're gonna have a bike lane. And if they're supposed to have a sidewalk, they're gonna have a sidewalk. Um, in some cases, it's just a matter of changing where we paint a line. In other cases, we've got to widen the road. In other cases, we actually have to narrow roads because the complete street plan actually also took into account um, stormwater runoff. So back 35, 40 years ago, um, the road standard for Montpelier was to um, do two, two 11 foot lanes plus an eight foot space for on-street parking. And this included streets that were like Liberty, um, not Liberty, but um, if you go up Northfield Street, there's some really big streets that kind of go off to the left where they're just single family homes, but there's enough to drive two, two lanes plus on-street parking. And we're just like, why do you need on-street parking if everybody's got a single family home with a big driveway? Nobody needs to park on the street. So we're just wasting asphalt and creating unnecessary stormwater runoff. So we can narrow this street um, or should we convert some of that to a sidewalk? And that's really what the question was when they did that street typology. Should this, at what point does this street warrant having a sidewalk? And what point does it not have to have one? So they have those plans, but what they don't have is, is a schedule for how we're gonna get there, you know, and whether that's a target of 2060, 2040, 2030, and obviously that is workload and money depends on how long it takes you to actually get all of your streets up to up to your code, up to your standard. Um, and they haven't had that discussion yet of what their timing is. They just have a plan that says we're going to get there. And every time we pave a road, we're going to visit whether or not we can or should make an adjustment to meet a requirement. Um, and, and so it's kind of a little bit more ad hoc. And I think if you want to get there, I think you need to have to be more deliberate and you've got to set a policy that says, this is, this is one of our priorities. And if it's a priority, then let's, let's put a, let's put a date on it. Let's put something out there that says, this is going to be our target. And maybe we don't make it on every street because the cost of doing East state is going to be $2 million because it's going to need a gigantic retaining wall. All right. So we, maybe we have to skip that one, but we really should, have a deliberate conversation about we're not going to we're not going to make this street a complete street and this is why because it's just too expensive but i would i would rather force decision maker decision makers to actually have that conversation i think it's also worth them talking about how similar to what you were just saying but how within not just saying we're going to get there, but within the all of the things that they have to do to get there, what are their priorities? So if the smaller streets are the priorities, or if they really, if State Street is the priority, that's the thing they want to do, then or East State specifically, um, yep. making those decisions, I think, is is important. Yeah, that would be helpful too. If they and they did, they did call out one. They did want to get the North South connector. That is one they identified as a priority, um, which is basically we have an east-west shared use path now that is complete, um, but we don't have something kind of kind of a, a shared use highway that would connect the north to the south of Montpelier. And they wanted to come up with where is the location and let's start getting the money going so we can build that shared use path that's basically similar in concept to the east-west path. Um, because then we can start building off of that um, to build a network. But that was the only one they prioritized. Does anyone have anything else?
Um, so, Mike, are you thinking that, uh, or, or maybe I missed this before, but um, will, will we have, uh, for our next meeting, will we have more fleshed out transportation plan, do you think? Will they meet? Uh, I sent, I just sent you a couple minutes ago the, the most up-to-date one. It had highlighted the areas that I had changed um, for them. Again, I didn't make any changes that you guys had recommended just because I didn't want to introduce another level of confusion for them. Um, once it's ours or yours, you're free to make that those, those changes as you see fit. I think the next meeting they have is October 6th will be their next meeting. And hopefully, as I said on theirs, they're supposed to just be talking about priorities. What what is their what are their top priorities for the next eight years that they want to work on? Should we should we take a break from the transportation plan then, and until we get a, a more final proposal from that committee, should we transition to something else? Uh, we might have to, I was just looking at the calendar. We do have another meeting of the planning commission on the 28th. So they still won't have that ready by the 28th. Um, so we may have to just take a break from the transportation section until they wrap it up. Unless, as I said, you guys wanted to start working on it. In theory, they're only supposed to be talking about priorities and not changing their strategies at this point. But again, I can't. It's tough for me to ever predict what a committee will do. Yeah, I can I can relate with that since I tried to predict what city council would do with Pioneer <laughs> Street and they did this the thing I said they wouldn't. So I get it. You're wiser than I. Uh, okay. What is, what what is what does everyone else think about about what we should try to do for next time then? No, we can. We could come up with something from the to work on housing again. I mean, we we could come back and report that the housing committee working group could go ahead and try to come back and report. Uh, that seems a, maybe premature, though. Yeah, yeah because think... we would only have had one meeting of yeah. the subcommittee uh, by that time. Mike, are there in any of the other chapters that are even close to what we should be looking at? Parks is meeting tomorrow night. Um, I talked to Alec today and he was saying they're meeting to talk about the information I had sent them. I gave them, I, I've met with them a couple times. I put together a draft for them to start working on and, and thinking through. Um, and so I, they only meet once a month, so it's going to take them probably a little bit of time. Um, transportation, natural resources. I've got to touch base. I, we got caught up on parks and didn't get a chance for me to ask him about the conservation commission because the natural resources chapter was also, uh, quite a, quite a ways in. Um, and the other one, uh, I've been working on is utilities and facilities, but I've got to try to see if I can set up a meeting with Donna and Kurt to kind of go over, um, where that is at. Um, so I, don't know. Um, it's not going to be on the top of my plate for the next couple of weeks. I do have to do the municipal planning grant application. Um, and I've got a couple other projects that I'm working on. Um, but I will try to see in sp specifically with the utilities and facilities. It would be nice if I could get that draft to you guys. Um, but I don't know the timing. DPW has been short staffed and a little bit straight out. So I got to see if I can get a couple hours of their time. Okay. Yeah, I was just looking at uh, what we had talked about <clears throat> previously about what, about the working groups reporting back. And it looks like, yeah, the CNS, the, the, CNS, the continuity and, and structure group is supposed to report back by October 12. So they're probably not going to be ready for next time. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, I saw a slight shake of the head from Stephanie there. So I'll take that as a nope, don't go there. Okay. Uh, and again, yeah, we, we had set a deadline for the housing group to come back on October 26th. So uh, we can hold off on that too. So it looks like maybe we'll just have a light meeting. Um, we'll I can add one possible thing which we can talk about um, briefly. Our dreaded, um, and I know everybody's, you're, you're free to groan um, for uh, a couple of zoning fixes that have come up that will, uh, which we could, should probably just take a look at. Um, these came out from uh, Dan Richardson acting as, as attorney for the folks who are doing the Sabins Pasture Project. And there were a couple of pieces. Uh, they're relatively small, but of course they're, they're small with large consequences. So we kind of just need to go and take a look at what they are suggesting. Uh, I'm as staff uh, supporting the, the changes um, really, in short, what, what it is is um, the traffic requirement, and it's actually not the traffic requirement that you guys had come up with, but the traffic requirement that city council came up with on the fly during this, the, their hearings. Um, the way it kind of nested in with the requirements, it makes it difficult to impossible for somebody to actually develop anything near Bar um, the Barry intersection because it's a, a class F intersection. So the way things are worded, you really can't do anything that will impact that, whether it's as far out as, as Sabins or even something smaller in close, just because if it's gonna trigger conditional use or if it's going to trigger subdivision, it automatically needs to meet that requirement. And so they came up with a set of suggestions uh, that as staff, we will go through and put a review in, but on a surface, it looks like it's logical. Um, there are basically two standards. There's, there's a standard and then there's two guide guidelines underneath it. And pretty much if we removed one of the guidelines, then the standard works just fine. Um, and I can go through and review those with you and show them. It's the guideline that ends up tripping up the whole system. And so what they want is just to go through and say, just follow the guide, just follow the standard. The standard is there. It's a, you know, it's, it's, it's one that DRB has all the power they need to approve or deny a project. And it's whether it has a, I think the requirement is whether the project will create a disproportionate and undue impact on uh, the quality of an intersection. So the way it was worded, made it that even if you didn't have an impact, if it was a failed intersection, we still couldn't approve the project. And so I, I think they were right. Um, and then there are two other requirements, both in the PUDs that made a certain PUD mandatory. And we'll have to just revisit. I know for those who were on the planning commission when we did the PUDs, there was a lot of conversation about trying to require these. And that makes it very problematic in certain projects. In the project that they're running, is going to be a, a good project, but um, by creating more than 40 units, they're tripped into doing a PUD, and the PUD makes it harder to do the project, actually makes it impossible to do the project. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we just have to go and look at whether or not we want to keep those as requirements or just make those PUDs as, as optional, and you get the benefits if you know you get the benefits if you do them but they don't need the benefits. They just, they're just looking to do a project. Um, and again, as I said, these guys are in savings pastures. So we're talking about being, you know, a proposal for a hundred and something housing units. Um, whether they get there, they, they can't even propose, they can't even put in an application or to propose it. They can't even start to design the project because it doesn't meet our zoning. So the first thing they need is for us to kind of go through and say, yeah, we're, we're willing to take a look yeah, at this. Look and if, if, if we make these three small changes or four small changes to the zoning, it will have a big impact because obviously if your goal was to require a PUD, then um, that kind of, um, it does make a big impact. But I think, I think, I don't think their requests were unreasonable. How's that? Um, and I think we should have a conversation about that. Um, not that 
we aren't sick and tired of doing zoning changes, but um, for for something as consequential as Saban's pasture and being to develop something within the TIF district, I think it's worth uh, taking a meeting to have that conversation. I mean, is it is it time sensitive? I mean, it, it, is it okay that we wait until next meeting? Um, it's it's it is somewhat time sensitive, but not to the extent that we need to be talking about it and making decisions tonight. Okay. I can scan their their letter that came in the mail the other day. Um, I didn't think we were going to have time to discuss it today, so I didn't um, include it in the packet. But I can get it out to you um, tomorrow or later tonight, um, so you guys can have the their request that they have, and we can just have that conversation at the next meeting. If there's nothing else going to be on the next meeting, we can just have that conversation. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Um, of, of what what do you have, Barb? I'm just wondering when you, Mike, when you referenced uh, the failed intersection, are you talking about Barry and Main Street? Yes. So even if the Sabins Pasture development um, would be affected by that rating, even though it's significantly down the street, so to speak. It is, and that's that's the issue that comes up. It is significantly down the street. Um, and we get rid of these like level of service ratings from the ITE that are from like 1986 Arizona or something. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, but it, and, and the impact the impact is is relatively minor in in a time scope because because we're looking at you know it's it's going to make things worse between four and five o'clock or four and six o'clock at night, but the rest of the day it doesn't. And the issue is okay well. We, we don't even have an option of balancing it to go through and say, is 130 units of housing, if that's what it is, 130 units of housing in Sabin's pasture, is that worth an extra 12 seconds at the intersection between four and six? Well, considering other intersections that could take some of the flow, it's yeah. not like it's a you know dead end street. So there are a lot yeah. of issues that, yeah. Yep. And so that's part of the question is right now, the way it's the, the way the zoning ordinance is written, it doesn't really even give us the option to, to consider adding even two seconds to that intersection. Even if we said it's, it's gonna make a two second difference, instead of waiting two minutes and 45 seconds, it's gonna be two minutes and 47 seconds at that intersection. And we might all go say, who cares? But from the, the technical standpoint, it's made it worse. So by just having a little bit more subjective um, and talking about that disproportionate impact on that intersection, um, you know, 10,000 vehicles go through that intersection and, we're, and that project could add an additional, um, I don't know, I'll, I'll make up a number, 60 cars. Okay, it made it worse, but that much worse enough to go and say we don't want any development in that area it is walkable it is bikeable it is on the public transit route it is you know there's so many other things that we could put a value on um and i think so i think his case he makes i think is 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 good i think dan does a good job of laying out why they think the the rule could be removed and i'll get you his argument and then I'll include the other two changes that were separate from this that had been talked about as well, um, which were the two PUD requirements that are causing causing some issues. So we can talk about all three of them, or yeah, basically it's three changes, um, and then we can decide whether or not it makes sense to to advance something. And it'll be through the winter. You know, we would just go through and say, yeah, it makes sense. Let's make these changes. Then I can work with my staff about actually drafting a strikeout version of what this would look like and getting the attorney opinions on that. And then maybe December or January, we're running a public hearing on it. And if it becomes critical where they're like, no, we want to go right now, then I can, with your blessing, take it to city council for an emergency zoning amendment. Um, I don't. I wouldn't probably recommend that as staff, considering it is Saban's pasture. Um, that is the trigger. I think. I think that would be not a, a 
procedurally the best way to go, but that's not my call to make. If city council says, no, we're, we're willing to take this up and take the heat from folks in that neighborhood, um, that's their call. I think a full process would probably be the most appropriate. Okay. That sounds good. That sounds good. And a, a good use of time next time. Uh, Stephanie, do you have something? So, yeah, random question. What happened to the planning around fixing the very Main Street intersection? Is there a plan in place for that? It's all, it's all a big, it's a big thing. Um, all the pieces kind of fit together. So we, we want to do that. We have the plan laid out for what we want to do, but it is not in the queue yet for getting in the capital improvement plan. It could jump up in priority if Sabin's pasture needs that intersection improved, um, either because if the intersection is improved, then um, it'll go from an F to a, to a D or an F to an E or whatever is the change in the level of service. Or even if it just makes the F a better F, then um, we might be able to move up the priority if we were able to take TIF funds from the development to go and make that improvement happen sooner. Um, so we're looking at a lot of things because we've got that the clock ticking on our TIF district. And if we can move a few projects forward, we can maybe get, you know, the intersection because we've talked about the intersection, Barry street itself, taking the on street parking off on the South side of the street out to the rec center. So that way the bike path will connect up and through. So that's all part of one project and it's, it's gotten through conceptual, but we don't have, we don't have permits. We don't have, um, a design constructed and documents or anything ready to go, but we could advance that project sooner if we had some funding that we could rely on. So we're at about there. Yeah. I was going to say, what's the, what's the plan for the intersection? Uh, they reviewed two options. One was to do a roundabout and a second one was just to do a conventional light. Um, the, uh, it, it was, it was much debated and the decision, final decision was to put in the light. And so the reason for that is what they want to, what they, the transportation folks want to be able to do is to take, um, the light at um, Memorial, the light at Barry, the light at Maine, and be able to do, i probably get this word wrong, uh, it's, it's like in, an intelligent system where they all communicate with each other and they're all, so they're all working together. So if they see a queue building up in one, they might open one up to let the cars through. So it's actually an interconnected system that works um, rather than each light working independently, the three lights would work in unison. So that was the proposal that went through. They wanted, I mean, everybody wanted to do the, the, the roundabout, but it actually made the bike path harder um, because of just how, how everything lines up um, to, to make the bike path work you were actually going to have to go and go through and do a four point turn. Basically you'd, you'd come up to the intersection and make a left and go down, then make a right to cross the street and then come back and cross the street again. So the, the, the roundabout wasn't, wasn't working, um, as well. Um, it worked better for the cars. If you were just talking cars, then you should do the roundabouts at all the intersections but it made the pedestrian traffic harder. And what we said was we wanted to prioritize the, the, the bike and the ped. And by having the light, you can hit the light, um, hit the button, the stop bar, you get the lights all turn red, everybody gets a safe crossing. And that was the, the safest way for people to get through those intersections. Um, and that was the decision of city council, not unanimously, but that was their decision was to go with the lights rather than the roundabouts. And then surprisingly, That's the terrible. Other, yeah. Uh, and then it surprised us as to where the decision was, where they went. The other, the other surprise was that the the downtown decision was to 
prioritize the pedestrians. So the, the sidewalks were wider, but they did not remove the on-street parking for bike lanes. I was almost positive that the bike lanes were going to win out, but the bike lanes did not win out. Um, the, the sidewalks would be wider. You know, if we did downtown reconstruction, according to the plan that was approved, sidewalks would get much wider, um, but there would still be the on-street on parking, although some of it would be converted to um, drop off um, for, for buses and for um, microtransit and for, for those types of services. There'd be a few more of those, but there'd still be the on-street um, on parking. There would not be the bike lanes. Um, the bikes would ride with the traffic, which was a little bit of a surprise that, you know, personally that that's where the, the council and committees went. Um, but now there's a proposal, which you'll see in the transportation plan, which is to slow down the speed limit in the downtown to 15 miles an hour. And I think that would, I would support that. If you're going to have bikes and cars riding together, I think it's unreasonable to expect that a bike rider will consistently be able to ride at the 25 mile an hour speed limit. Um, if you're going to force everybody to merge together, then you're going to have to slow down the cars to 15 miles an hour. So that way bikes can reasonably travel with traffic. I'll, I'll just throw it out there. I'm opposed to using speed limits to do anything. Like we need to do it through urban design. It's a, it, it serves no, it lets us feel good about ourselves maybe, but like it serves no purpose. It's not safer. It certainly doesn't seem safer. Um, I didn't. I didn't realize. I guess that they didn't take any on-street parking off. There was some loss of on-street parking. Um, most of the loss of on-street parking were for um, other pedestrian items, such as um, putting bump outs in for the crosswalks. Um, that costs you park some parking spaces um, and a couple other things like that. But in general, the loss of parking was. Um, there was a loss of on-street parking, but not to the extent of if you wanted to put in bike lanes, we're going to lose, you know, 60 parking spaces over here. And, you know, just because you couldn't fit everything in, we have a limited number of land, limited amount of land, land to deal with. So, um, that would be how things would, would break out as you lose parking for the bike lanes. <sighs> And the thought was there's just not enough bikers to warrant. And the, at least this was the, the opinion and the decision at the time was there's just not enough bikers to warrant losing that much on street parking. Um, and I think it's the field of dreams um, scenario. I mean, maybe there aren't bikers because it's not safe. And if we made it safer, then there'd be more bikers. But the opinion is there aren't enough bikers to warrant taking them off. Um, and whether it's right or wrong, that's, that was where the decision ended up. Yeah, I know that there was a, I think there was a nine-year-old nine -year girl who was killed riding her bike. Uh, I think it was in Chittenden County a couple weeks ago. And uh, I know, yeah, the way that Montpelier is set up, I don't want my girls riding on the road. I, that should be a uh, metric for our transportation plan is just no deaths. Isn't that, um, isn't that a New York City thing, the zero? Vision zero, yeah. Vision zero, thank you. Um, and even if we don't, I mean, we've had, we've had people, they weren't killed, but we've had um, young people hit by cars. Um, out in front of the library last year was one. Um, it's, it's certain, certainly needs to prioritize. And, and I think that's part of the balance. Um, and we'll see, as I said, I, I, I think, I think at some point there may be some revisiting, maybe not. Um, you know, I, I always hate to redo master plans, uh, when, when you put in that much work to do one, but it did seem like it was very surprising that, um, the, the way things ended up. Um, did surprise me. Um, it was nice to see that they prioritized pedestrian as much as they did. Pretty much their thought was everybody's a pedestrian. Um, whether you bike into town, you're going to be walking, or whether you're um, driving into town, you're going to be walking. So everybody's a pedestrian, and we, we're going to 
emphasize that mode of transportation. Um, but was there any discussion of involving the planning commission? I know they had a lot of public hearings and public meetings um, that, that was run by um, um, SE group. They did a lot of stuff that was outside. I think it was when we were kind of waist deep in one of our other projects. Um, so we probably should have brought them back around to have more of a direct conversation about some of the priorities. They were working very directly with the transportation committee, which is why I kind of expected a different answer than we got. You're, you're muted, Barb. Sorry. Is there a final document that actually gives us what the, the city council approved um, yeah. as, as a, okay, rather than just the proposal that they had made earlier? No, there's, there's a final document, SE group made a presentation to city council on it so. i think i think it would be it would be relevant to our discussion next week to know what uh I, you, I know you already described it for us but maybe if you if you have the, at least the part of that document that has the berry street solution so we know i'll send out the link it's i think if i remember it's a pretty big document so if you have slow internet be careful about downloading it Mike, we live in Montpelier. We have great I, internet here, don't we? <laughs> all you lucky people with fast internet speed. Oh, yeah. Not when we're all working from home. Something happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We, we can't watch television and download a document that would crash the system, so. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Well, does uh, does anyone have anything else before we adjourn the meeting tonight? Looks like we've lined up some work for ourselves next week. Always good. Or two weeks next meeting. Anything? Okay. Well, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Barb. We have a second. second. Okay. Second by Stephanie. All in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Okay. No, no one wants to just insist on hanging out more. Okay. All right. With that, uh, we are adjourned and uh, we'll see you at the next meeting. Thanks a lot, everyone. Okay.